If you would go ahead and pull out your Bibles with me and turn in the New Testament to John chapter 10. That's where we will be this morning. Uh, like I said earlier, this is the second message in our series called the I Am Sayings of Jesus. And uh, we'll find ourselves in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10 this morning. And we're going to really key in on verses 7 through 10. That's where we'll really focus in as we get into this. Y'all doing well? Everybody doing good this morning? Good deal. Um, we're going to talk about where Jesus said, I am the door. Now, last week, uh, we looked at our first I am saying, and Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said he is uh, the sustainer, that uh, there is no hunger, there's no thirst that he can't cover in life, that Jesus Christ is sufficient. Do you believe that, church? He is sufficient for every need that we have um, and, and always will be. Um, and here's, to me, is what is the really cool thing about this series, uh, we're as we're looking at these I am statements, we're seeing, like I said earlier, who Jesus says that he is. In all these I am statements that we find in the book of John, Jesus is telling us who he is in his own words. Um, he, he's, not, uh, he's not, you know, we're not looking at who we think Jesus is. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We're not uh, talking about what we have been taught about Jesus and what that makes us think about who he is. Um, we're, we're not talking about what we have grown up accustomed to thinking about Jesus. We're not, uh, go here with me, we're not, even gonna, we're not even talking about who CNN or Fox News says Jesus is, right? Uh, we're, not, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about what uh, Washington, D.C. defines as Jesus or what Hollywood tells us Jesus is. Um, I mean, we're, we're not talking about who Oprah says Jesus is. Right, and we're, I mean, we're not even talking about who Morgan Freeman says Jesus is, right? And, uh, and so we're talking about who Jesus says he is. We're, we're looking at that, and, and why is that so important? I mentioned it earlier, and this is on your newsletter if you're taking notes, but um, it's so important because when we know who Jesus is, when we know who Jesus says he is, when we understand that, then we better understand who he is calling us to be. If you don't walk out with anything, get that today. When we better understand who Jesus is, then we better understand who Jesus is calling us to be. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10 read like this. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Verse 2 says, But... He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then look at verse 7, it says, So Jesus again said to them, he's talking to Pharisees here, and, and he's using this analogy, and they weren't quite getting that he was actually talking about them. He was saying, you're the thieves, you're the robbers, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So Jesus again said to them, verse 7, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we have read your word. And Lord, now I pray that, uh, that this word would, would change our lives, Lord, this morning. Lord, Lord, I believe that your word changes lives, and I pray that we don't walk out of here in a little while not being changed by your word. So, Lord, ever how you need to speak to us, Lord, there are a lot of believers in this room, and I pray you would challenge us and grow us and find, her at a, find us at a place of deeper faith. And, Father, I pray for anyone that may be lost this morning, that may not be in the sheepfold. Lord, I pray that they would see that you're the door, Lord, that you're the gate, and they would walk through it. Father, use this word to change us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 
Listen, to, uh, to understand this just a little bit better, I want to I read another version of it. I want to read it from the New Living Translation now. Understand this. I don't preach from, from the New Living Translation. I like to preach from literal translations where you're getting the Greek and Hebrew translated. But the New Living is a, is a pretty good version sometimes just to kind of get it in your mind's eye a little bit better. So listen to this. The Scripture says this, John 10, 1 through 10. It says, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice, and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. He said, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Also use the word door. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And so Jesus is talking to these Pharisees. The Pharisees were teachers of the law. They knew everything about the Torah, which was the beginning part of the Old Testament. They knew all the laws, and they kept a lot of the laws, and they were, they were really good at it. So, but Jesus was calling them out because they were adamantly opposed to Jesus Christ. And we'll, we'll see that he's saying to the Pharisees, he's looking them straight in the eye, and he's using this story, and he's saying, look, you've got it all wrong. You're misunderstanding what life is all about. You're the thieves and the robbers. You're just like them. So to get in the context, let me, let me kind of explain to, to how we got to this point in John chapter 10, because we're just picking up in the middle of the book of John. In, in John chapter 9, if you've got your Bibles there, we won't, I won't read all the scriptures, but you can just kind of glance at John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, we find Jesus, and he, he's healed this beggar who was born blind. And he, he did this on a time that the Pharisees would have disagreed with him doing it. He did it on the Sabbath day, which was a, which was a big no-no to the Pharisees. Um, because they were religious leaders of the day, and they kept the law. And so Jesus did this on the, on the Sabbath. And the beggar didn't know who did this. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know that he was the Son of God. But he had healed him, and so he defended Jesus to the Pharisees, and eventually this beggar, who was blind, who had been healed, was kicked out of the synagogue by the Pharisees. Essentially, this means that his church privileges were revoked. They, they kicked him out of the church, which now was a worse social status than he had before, when he was a blind beggar. Now he was a guy who had been kicked out of the church. And in, and in verse 38 of chapter 9, if you, if you look at that, in verse 38 of chapter 9, it says that he got saved, that he experienced salvation. It's, it says, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped Jesus. This man believed. And, and so as we read that, and we see that he was saved, and he believed, and he placed his faith in Jesus Christ, the Pharisees were even more unhappy. They were, they were unhappy, and Jesus called them on the carpet about it in the last few verses of chapter 9, especially this reference that you're going to see that he makes, and he tells them, this man was blind, but you are spiritually blind. This man couldn't physically see, but you can't see spiritually. He says in verse 37, he says, you've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. You've, you've looked at Jesus, and You've looked at me, and I'm speaking to you, yet you still don't see you're spiritually blind. And so the Scripture says that it, it goes on, it says, Judgment came into this world for those who, uh, who do not see, so that they may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And listen to what Jesus said in verse 41, the last verse before we get to chapter 10. It says, Jesus said to these Pharisees, if you were blind, you would, have no, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. He says, you're guilty. You're thieves and robbers. You don't understand. You don't get it. You can keep a bunch of rules and laws, but you don't understand anything about having a relationship with me. Now, with that in mind and knowing the setting, let's reread verses 1 through 6. 
of John chapter 10. So Jesus responds to them like this. He begins to tell this parable about sheep and shepherds and a gate and all this stuff. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did, under, did not understand what he was saying to them. So to understand what Jesus was saying, we need to understand the full idea behind the term shepherd. And here again, that's going to be a whole other sermon in this I Am series. But just real quickly this morning, um, understand that shepherds and sheep were a big thing in the Bible. Okay, we, may not, we may not see that much in 2018 where we, where we live, but, but it was, I mean, even from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, we see that Abel, of Cain and Abel, Abel was a shepherd. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were shepherds. Jacob's sons were shepherds. Moses, a shepherd. King David was a shepherd. And he referred to the Lord as his shepherd in Psalm 23. You see, the shepherd was... What was the shepherd responsible for? The shepherd was responsible for, um, for caring for and watching over the flock. When it was time to find water, the shepherd led them there. When food was scarce, it was the shepherd's role to, to find sustainable pasture for the sheep. The shepherd was the only one to defend the sheep against wild animals. The shepherd, get this, the shepherd would lay across the opening of the sheep pen so only as to let the sheep that were in his flock through and anything else, he would defend the, he would defend the pen. So in the same way, understand that God cares for us. He meets our needs. He provides for us. He protects us. He is our shepherd. David was right to call the Lord his shepherd but he wasn't the first to do that. Jacob did that in Genesis 48, 15. It says, he's the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day. Do you believe today that God is your shepherd? All the days of your life. The word shepherd came to represent not just literal shepherds in the Bible, but also leaders, both religious leaders and political leaders. A king or a priest uh, cared for Israel in much the same way as a shepherd would care for his sheep. Psalm 78 describes King David this way. It says, He, being God, chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens from tending the sheep, and he brought him to be shepherd of his people. That's what it said about David. So, it, it, at times of good leadership, the, the, the nation was called a, a, a nation that followed after the good shepherd. At times of bad leadership, the nation was described like a flock of sheep without a shepherd. I mean, some, some leaders failed, and, and they weren't good shepherds. So, there's kind of a background on shepherds, and maybe that's helpful, because if you're like me, it, it, you, you don't know much about shepherding and sheep and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I grew up on a small form, f farm, and I understand cattle and tractors a little bit, but sheep, I've never had any experience with sheep. And maybe a few of you have, but probably not, not most of us. I mean, most of my experience with sheep came from watching Looney Tunes when I was growing up. In the late 70s, y'all remember, remember Ralph the Wolf and Sam the Sheepdog on Looney Tunes? That's where I learned about it. It's like they were, on, they were clocked in to work every morning together. They punched the same time card and then fought all day and then they punched, the, they punched out in the afternoon. That doesn't give me a good background on what, what, what sheep and shepherds do. And, and so I need a better understanding of that but this crowd around Jesus would have understood, but they didn't get the spiritual ramifications. He's talking about sheep and shepherds, and they get that. But, but it, says, it says right there in verse 6, they, they didn't grasp what he was saying. He was telling them a story, and they understood what shepherds do and what sheep do, but they didn't get that he was talking about them spiritually, that they were thieves and robbers. The, the, the typical sheepfold was was enclosed by a pen, and you can kind of get this in your mind, it was made out of rocks. Most of the time it was either circular or sometimes in a rectangular shape. And it had just one door that the sheep could go through. And at night, like I said earlier, the, she the shepherd would actually lie across the opening or the door to guard it. 
A thief, if the thief was going to steal any sheep, then he would have to come in some other way, into the enclosure. And so Jesus is passing judgment on these Pharisees by saying, you're like the thieves. They, they, you didn't come through the door. You, you came in and you, you, you're, you're like thieves and robbers. You're trying to get in another way. And, and he's saying, you've got to be more like the blind beggar that I healed. Someone who has faith and trust and believes. So Jesus is throwing out everything that they've thought was right and, and, and all the churchy stuff. Warren Wiersbe said this, he said, It's not unusual for several flocks to be sheltered together in the same fold. In the morning, the shepherds would come and call their sheep and assemble their own flocks. Each sheep recognized its master's voice. That imagery is powerful because there are a lot of competing voices in our time. Would you agree with that? He said, some voices are other faiths, while other voices claim all faiths are equally valid. There are voices of materialism and voices of individualism that say, live for yourself and not for God and you'll just be fine. All these voices call for us to follow them, but they are false voices, he said. They're false shepherds except for the one true shepherd. And he asked this question, Warren Wiersbe asked this, he said, which one will we follow? The one whose voice we know? The more we know the true shepherd, the better we'll be at following Jesus' voice. Jesus' sheep listen to his voice. And so it leads us to a question this morning as we, as we get deeper in this. Whose voice do you listen to the most? Jesus is saying, I'm the true shepherd. And we move to verses 7 through 10, and I told you that would be the main part of our scripture this morning. He actually hones in on something, listen to me, that is life-changing when a person gets it. He describes himself not only as the shepherd, but he says, I am the door. And like I said, the people had not understood. You read verse 6, and it's obvious they had not understood his teaching to this point. So he plainly told them in verse 7, he says, you need to understand, I am the door. I am the gate for the sheep. He alone is the access point for his flock. Pretty sure I wrote this on your newsletter this morning as well. Only through Jesus, our access point. Only through Jesus, get that, our access point, can we have the fulfillment that we often think we can find through all those other voices that we hear in life. It's only through Jesus who's our access point that we can have the fulfillment that we often think that we're fooled into thinking we can find fulfillment in. It's only, it's only through Jesus. Four chapters later, this is another sermon in this series, he makes this truth even more plain. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But as that access point, the access point of Jesus Christ, it is only there, listen to me, church, that we can know God and that we can ever have every true need that we have met in life. It's only through that access point, Jesus Christ. We aren't living if we don't go through that access point. If we don't go through that gate of the sheep pen, the door, Jesus says, I am the gate, I am the door. And the key verse in this, and we'll come back to it, but I want you to see it as we enter in. The key verse in it is verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And you put that up against the backdrop of some awesome scriptures like Psalm 23, where David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You begin to understand that, that imagery. And, and Jesus is using the vernacular of their day because he understood that while they may not understand the spiritual ramifications, he can use this example of sheep talk and they'll begin to get it. It's kind of like for us, we would say, you know, you don't, if you don't know how to fix a car, you don't try to do it yourself. You take it to the mechanic. If you're sick, you don't like, you know, try to do home remedy, you go to the doctor, he's saying, you can't come into the sheepfold unless you come through the shepherd, unless you come through the gate. 
The true sheep only enter through the gate. And so he says, I am the door in John 10, 7 through 9. And there's so many doors we can walk through in life. We can try to walk through the door of financial gain at the expense of other people. We can try to walk through the, the door of pleasure and do everything for ourselves. We can try to walk through the door that exposes other people so that we can better ourselves. The list, that list goes on and on and on. That list never ends. We can walk through a lot of doors that entice and speak to wants in our lives, but never speak to the real one need that we all have, and that is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When, when I was growing up, my parents taught me the value of giving to God's work. And this is not a tithing sermon, but they taught me that. They, they taught me about the value of giving an offering to make that my first financial, uh, the first thing that I did financially, giving back to God before I spent on myself. Because it's all His anyway. And they taught me that spiritual lesson. And they also taught me the value of saving my money as well. And the result is that I would have money when there was truly a need, and we've seen that before. I just wrecked two of our cars in our driveway. I slammed into Sharon's van, and we needed money to be able to repair them. And, and, and as much as it hurt, because I'm a cheapo, you know, we, we had, you know I, I learned that, value, that lesson early on, to, to have some there to pay for things, because things, you know, stuff happens, right? It, so that you can, you can pay for true needs, and you're not always spending your life on, on wants. And so that, my parents, in that way and in many other ways, were a good door for me to walk through. And I had other people that were good doors for me to walk through. I can remember when I was a freshman at Sanford University, and Dr. Robert Franklin, who was the dean of students, for whatever reason, in, invested in my life. I just happened to end up in one of his classes, like a freshman orientation class, and he just invested in my life, and I'll never forget it. He was a good door to, for me to walk through at that point in time. I can remember my first real boss in ministry, Dr. LeVan Parker, and Sharon will smile at me, but he taught me so many lessons. He smelled like baby powder every day, but he taught me so many lessons in life. And I thought he was 83 then, and he's like 83 now. I mean, he's just one of those guys. He just spoke to my life. He did. I'll never forget, I was a... I had seven or eight jobs. I was in, in some, like some of the jobs, they didn't even know I had another job. You know, and so we were, I was working at Central Park Baptist Church. I was a youth minister there. I was teaching at Central Park Christian School. I was the girls' basketball coach at the school and assistant for the boys' uh, basketball team. I was going to seminary, and I was working at Sanford University. And we were, Sharon and I had just gotten married, and we were still living on the campus there. And we were, I was driving across town to the inner city to, to, to work at Central Park School. And I talked to Dr. Parker. I said, I, it was the most populated zip code in the state of Alabama. And I said, we need to do see you at the poll. Any of y'all ever been to see you at the poll at school? Well, back in that day, they had never done it. And so I said, we got to do see you at the poll. It, it, we got to do it. And let's invite the whole community. Let's see if people will just show up for it. And he was like, let's do it. I'm going to let you do it. Let's, you go and you plan it and you do it and you promote it and... And so, and back in that day, you did, we didn't have the computer to make up a flyer, and so I was, I was actually taking tape and, and, like, typing stuff out and pasting on a piece of paper and running it off on a copier, and then I would use liquid paper to make the lines go away and run it again. I'm handing out flyers in the community. And I, and I always got to work there early. I had to drive across town, and so I'd leave early for traffic. And I'd planned on going, but, but me, guess what I did? I, I didn't change my alarm clock the night before. I went to bed realizing I needed to get there early for see at the pole because I had planned it and I was running it. And it started at 7, and I usually always got to school by 10 after 7 anyway. But for whatever reason, I went to bed thinking that I'd changed my alarm clock, but I didn't. So I got up like I normally did, didn't think about the time, got ready, knew I was headed to see at the pole. I get nearly to Central Park, and I realize... It's seven minutes after seven. This thing started seven minutes ago, and I'm in charge of it. And you talk about your heart sinking. I drive up, and there's 300 people standing out by the flagpole, and Murph's not there. And I walk up, and they never even, they just thought the event started a little bit late. They never really knew that I was late. I was leading worship. I ran up with my guitar and grabbed the sound stuff that I'd laid out in the, right by the door and pulled it in. We got it, and we were going by about 7.15, and we cut a few things off, and then the guy that was speaking came on, and he spoke, and he knew I was late, and we winked at each other, and we did it. And 
I remember thinking, I've got to go talk to Dr. Parker after this. And I remember walking up to him, and, and all he said, he looked at me, smelled like baby powder. He looked at me, he said, I bet you'll never do that again, will you? And I said, no, sir, I won't. And he said, if God can be gracious, so can I. You know, and, and it, it just, I, I never, I'll never forget it, because he was a door that I walked through who, that taught me about grace, that taught me about, he, he exemplified it to me. And so it, it, but it's so easy to, to walk through the wrong doors. It's so easy to walk through the, the doors that promise pleasure, the things that we think lead to hope, but in the end, end in death and destruction. So what I'm getting at today, there's only two doors. There's a door to death. This, it's the door that lures and pleases and gratifies, but it leads to death and destruction. And then there's the door to life. And the door to life is one man, which is Jesus, one way, which is Jesus, and one life, which is Jesus Christ. And so the big question is, where do you find yourself this morning? Where do you find yourself entering into, and what do you find yourself pursuing? And we find three things in in verses 7 through 10. And for lack of a better way to do it, I'm just going to call it the three eyes this morning. So if you're taking notes, we see it in verses 7 through 10. Three eyes, introduction, invitation, and illumination, because that's what Jesus gives them. And imagine the hearts of these Jews, these Pharisees, as Jesus calls them out. He's saying, you're the thieves. You're not in the flock of the sheep. You're indeed of the Father, but not who you think. Not your father Abraham, not God the Father either, but you're, you're of your father the devil. That's actually what he's telling them. You're not following after Yahweh God. You're following the ways of the world and you're following after Satan. And the character of these Pharisees was one of anger. So that's why Jesus uses this imagery in chapter 10. So point number one, we see it in verse 7, is his introduction. Jesus says, okay, if you're not understanding right now, let me introduce myself in case you haven't already understood. He said to them, He said again to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, here's the introduction, I am the door of the sheep. Like I said, they had followed the Torah. They knew the books of the law of the Bible. They knew it to the nth degree. They saw themselves as gatekeepers of righteousness. They saw themselves as people. They thought they could make intercession to God on the part of other people. Because they thought they were so good, and Jesus blew that up. He said, you're not who you think you are. No one can be saved unless they have a relationship with me. No one has power to save but God himself. And he says, I am God. I am the door. But they didn't celebrate that. Remember what they did to the blind man? After being healed, instead of celebrating what God could do, they didn't believe that Jesus was God, so they exiled the man and because he was testifying to the healing power of Christ. They cared more about their own power than the healing power of God. They cared more about their own glory, their own control, their own ways, their own will, their own systems, than they did about the gospel, than they did about the way that God calls people to himself. So he reintroduces himself to them. He said, and so that's why the first point is is introduction. Jesus says, I'm the door. He blew up their whole way of thinking and living. He said, you're thieves and you're robbers. He blew it up right in their faces and they didn't like it at all. As my daughter would say, he blowed it up. When she was was little, she had a little kitty cat and we were building our house. And we had a burn pile out by the house and one of my neighbors, I wouldn't call his name because some of you would know him, said, hey, I can help you burn that pile. And he threw gasoline on it. Don't ever do that. And he threw... threw a match on it, and I'm talking about an explosion. I don't know how it didn't blow up the neighborhood. Boom! And Emma comes running outside, and she said, and we didn't know it, her little kitty cat had run out, and she saw it run into the burn pile. Just a little earlier. And she said, Daddy, you blowed up my kitty. You blowed up my kitty. And you talk about like, Dad of the Year Award, I thought. I blowed up her kitty, what do you do? And then the cat came around the corner, and we found the cat, and we're like, thank you. But Jesus blowed that up. Jesus blowed up what the Pharisees 
thought. He's saying, I'm the door you have to walk through. He's saying, you don't get it. You're a bunch of rule keepers, but in my frame, there's love, and you don't know that. You don't understand it. In my frame, there's grace. Ephesians 2, 5, by grace you've been saved. You don't understand that. In my frame, there's mercy. In my frame, there's forgiveness and joy and peace and patience and kindness, and you don't get any of that. Jesus is communicating that He's the only way into relationship with God. You'll never enter into heaven unless you come through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. He's, he's saying, I'm the only way to eternal life with God. That He's the one and only way to be forgiven of sin. He's foretelling actually something that would happen ten chapters later in the book of John. He's foretelling this, that on the cross, He was going to be the one to absorb the wrath of God for our sin. And that He would be risen up after dying. And in so doing, He would conquer sin so that we may enter in through Him. In the relationship with God, Jesus, the gracious, loving, forgiving Savior, the only life-giving door that we can walk through. But the Pharisees missed Him. They missed, get this, they missed the King of glory and He was standing right in front of them. They missed Him. They missed the one full of mercy and grace and forgiveness. In arrogance and in pride and in trying to do life their way, they stared Jesus right in the face and they missed the King of glory. They missed the door. So when we miss Jesus, when we miss the door, when we think life is about other stuff, Jesus said when you do that, you continue to walk in darkness and in lies and in false hopes. But Christ is the life. Christ is the hope. Christ is relationship with God. And the proof that they missed Jesus standing right in front of them comes out in Jesus' words in verse 8. Look at it. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. And he's saying, that's you. You're not listening. You don't get it. And that leads to the second point, verse 9, and that's, the, and that's invitation. And so Jesus invites him. He says, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He's saying, that's what you've got to do. If anyone enters by me. And, and that's crazy. They miss him as he invites them. Dumb Pharisees, right? Dumb, stupid Pharisees. How could you miss Jesus standing right in front of you? Inviting you. How could you miss the one who gives hope and redemption and forgiveness in life? Dumb, dumb, stupid Pharisees. Here's the reality this morning. In this room, many of us are Christians. There are many people sitting in this room who are Christians. Many, many of you, many of us in here today have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. God, by His grace, saved us. He, he gave, and listen, if you're a Christian, He gave you the very call to repent of your sin and the very ability that you had to trust and believe. And you entered into relationship with Jesus Christ. You left the old life, you were saved, and forever you'll be saved. Because God saved you. Many in this room today are born again believers in Jesus Christ. We're disciples of Jesus Christ. But we still battle each day, don't we? We battle like Paul said in Romans chapter 7 where he says, I know I'm set free, but I'm battling with sin. But we walk through the door that matters. We, we, we have this daily battle going on, these, these little doors that we have to face. And, and as we walk through the right ones, we grow in our relationship with Christ, but we walk through the main gate. We walk through the door, and we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. But then there are some here in this room this morning, and you may be, honestly, if you're honest with yourself, you're in the same position as the Pharisees. You haven't been saved by Christ. You do some good things. You're pretty good at doing some good things. You're a pretty good lady, pretty good guy, pretty good girl, pretty good boy. Most people would say that you're good, but you don't have life because you haven't come through the gate of Jesus Christ. You haven't come into the fold because you haven't come through the door. If, if that's you today, if you can sit here this morning and you, and you can say, you know, to be honest, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know for sure that if I were to breathe my last breath 
on this earth that I would enter into the presence of God? Let me just say that you're accountable now. Today you're hearing and seeing that Jesus Christ is the door and the only door that you can walk through to have eternal life with God. You cannot spend eternity with God when you leave this earth if you don't come through the door of Jesus Christ. So if that's you, whether you're 14 or 27 or 43 or 68, it doesn't matter. Let me ask you, if that's you, if you're being honest, then answer me this. What doors are before you that present themselves to you as giving life that, are, that you found to be more important than going through the right door, which is Jesus? Because all those doors will end in death. For the Pharisees, it was their works. It was keeping a bunch of rules. They thought... If I do this, and this, and this, and this, then I'll have favor with God. But they miss Jesus. They miss God by doing that. What, what, are some of the, what are some of your doors? What are the false doors? What are the idols that we face? What's keeping you from understanding who Christ is? Is it a drive for perfection? Everything always has to be good and right, and you exhaustingly pursue perfection? Is it power, pursuing control? Is it success, never content? Maybe get this one. Is it a spouse? Maybe you're a person who, who defines yourself like this. Who I am is found and defined in my wife or my husband or my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Not God. Listen, people can't save you. Your identity can't be found in someone else. Is it your children? My life is my children. I'm a mother and a father and that's who I am rather than understanding that you're a child of God? Is it beauty, chasing after what the world says is beauty and never resting in the biblical truth that you are made in the image of a holy God? Is it the pursuit of self? Is it pride, arrogance? Is it intellect, a life consumed with what I know? You can know everything about Jesus and still miss Jesus. And, and some of these things are good things. But when we put them on a pedestal and we begin to worship them, here's the reality. They make horrible gods. Those things never save. They have no power to save. They never bring redemption. They never get you into relationship with God. So Jesus points out two types of people. Two types. The only two types they are. Those that are cared for by the shepherd. Those that are in the fold and those that are not. Listen, if you, if you don't know Jesus, you've got to come through the door. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you come through the door. And point number three, real quickly. Point number three, and it's verse 10. It's the last verse. It's illumination. Jesus Puts light on this whole thing. There again, another sermon in this series. Jesus said, I am the light. And he shows us that he is light. He says that in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That illumination that he shows here is exactly what Paul talked about in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. He said, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, if you're a Christian, this used to be you, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by, by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from Him, by Him from the wrath of God? Listen, Christians, those who have walked through the door of Jesus are set free from the bondage of sin and Satan forever into eternal hope with Jesus Christ. And let me make something real clear about verse 10, because it gives this, this imagery um, followed up by following verse 9 about salvation. And what this is not saying is verse 9 had said that they come in and out and find pasture. It's not telling us that th this, this imagery of that you can, be, you can be saved and then you can be unsaved. You can come in and you can come out. That's not what that's talking about. Because when you're in the fold, you're in the fold. If you're really in the fold, then you're in the fold. And you're not strong enough to undo something that God does. But this, what this imagery is, is that sheep need nourishment and provision and help, and God provides everything that we need. They're in the flock, and the shepherd's the door for the sheep. 
and they come into the pen for protection at night, and he can let them go out to find pasture during the day to find nourishment, and they have all that they need. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Listen, in Jesus Christ we don't have every want fulfilled, but every need is fulfilled beyond measure. I promise that. The shepherd knows every need. That's freeing, isn't it? The need of comfort and truth and hope and so on and so on is supplied through Jesus Christ. Listen to... Today's invitation is, is simply this. I read Ezekiel before the band started playing this morning, before we, before we read, and it talked about the shepherd and the sheep. But true salvation is found only through the shepherd, only in Christ.